Welcome to the Shakespeare Authorship Roundtable, where we have provided a safe forum to discuss varying views on the Shakespeare authorship question for 38 years. My mother, Barbara Crowley, started this group in 1985 with Carol Sue Lipman, who is still our president. It is very important to us that our speakers feel welcome. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Therefore, please let us all keep an open mind. I'm passing the mic over to Carol Sue Lipman. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are excited to welcome back Bob Prechter to the roundtable. Those of you who don't know Bob, he attended Yale University, where he received a BA in psychology in 1971. He is also a member of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship and the Triple Nine Society. Today's talk, he will focus on the possibility that the poet Thomas Nash was one of Oxford's voices. Welcome back, Bob. Well, it's great to be here. And uh, I want to start by thanking Rima Lynn and Sylvia and Carol, and everybody at this Shakespeare Authorship Roundtable for providing a forum for diverse opinions. It's so important. And uh, again, it, you don't have to agree with everything, but lend an ear and sometimes you'll learn something and maybe you'll get entertained. I hope you are going to take an hour out of your Saturday and get some entertainment out of it today. I guess I'll start by just pointing out that a single fact can sometimes overthrow a paradigm. Uh, a good example in my mind is the discovery that Will Shakespeare of Stratford's family members signed with a mark. Now, that's just one of a thousand reasons that Ox Oxfordians think Will Shakespeare of Stratford did not write the Shakespeare canon, but it is so powerful that I think anybody with an objective mind has to stop in his tracks and say, does that make any sense that he came from illiterate, an illiterate family, the most erudite person in the history of the world and one of the most educated? Well, tradition, I've found out through my lifetime, is a very powerful thing. Um, I think traditions are fun and there's a good place for them, but I don't think they're a source of truth. You have to look at facts for that. Well, Thomas Nash uh, has a long tradition associated with him. And what I'm going to try to do today is, is introduce some facts and see where they lead us. My screen is up there. And if you give me the go ahead, we will go ahead. The question we're asking ourselves today is, did Thomas Nash exist or was he a persona of the Earl of Oxford? Various Oxfordians have proposed that Oxford wrote under other people's names. Those names include Arthur Brooke, Arthur Golding, John Lilly, Robert Greene, and William Shakespeare. Should Thomas Nash be on this list? Nash is elusive. Thomas Nash is perhaps the most elusive of all the university wits, we're told. Despite writing vividly in the first person in book after book, one feels that the man is, quote, too shadowy and unrevealed. Well, Nash is physically elusive as well. People who seek him out never locate him. They include Gabriel Harvey, who requested a personal conference with Nash, but was told he could only go through one intermediary after another. Richard Litchfield, who made a general call for any information to be provided about this man, Thomas Nash, and as far as we know, no one ever replied. The authorities tried to find him in 1593 and failed, and the authorities tried to find him again in 1597 and failed. Now we're going to cover a broad topic, which is the intimate links between Nash and Shakespeare and see where that takes us. Nash and Shakespeare share an ocean of linguistic parallels. This is not a claim that I'm coming up with. It is widely discussed in orthodox scholarship. McCarthy wrote, they are distributed over almost the whole of Nash's oeuvre and many of Shakespeare's histories and comedies, including the following 15 plays. Now keep in mind that none of Shakespeare's plays had been published at that point. Traces of Nash's works, in turn, and they list five different works, have been described by Tobin in Shakespeare's Hamlet. And Hamlet was written in the 1580s. So I don't see how 
Shakespeare could have drawn from future pamphlets to write Hamlet, unless we are going to be talking about quantum physics here and backwards in time. Tobin wrote, Nash is so much a part of the fabric of Shakespeare's works that it is not too much to say that Shakespeare without Nash and his works would not be Shakespeare. It also works in reverse. We find in the epistle of Have With You, which is one of Nash's pamphlets, no less than three echoes from the first 17 of Shakespeare's sonnets. So Nash without Shakespeare would, it would not be Nash either. It works both ways. Now, if we had a scenario or a history whereby, say, an independent Thomas Nash and an independent Will Shakespeare had uh, been roommates since age 12 and worked together to produce different works, that would be one thing. But, of course, we have nothing of the kind. Neither person mentions the other. Nash never mentions William Shakespeare, and Shakespeare never mentions Nash. But somehow they're tied to the hip linguistically. Orthodoxy cannot explain these correspondences. Scholars are frankly befuddled. J. Dover Wilson said in conclusion that he could not account for them. Tobin speaks of Shakespeare's habit of absorbing words and phrases from Nash and weaving them into this texture and structure of his plays. McCarthy declared it is hard to imagine the process by which scraps of five of Nash's works keep floating into Shakespeare's head and eventually forced their way into the diction of Hamlet with such huge freight of apparently personal emotion. So it's not just that they share all these similar ideas and expressions, but they have the same emotional attachment to them. I think it is beyond hard to imagine because no scholar has actually imagined any explanation, so it must be actually beyond imagining. If Nash is Shakespeare, there is no mystery and no angst. It's one writer doing both sets of works. And orthodoxy has had difficulty trying to decide who borrowed from whom. Biographers are certain that Shakespeare borrowed from Nash, for example, but they cannot make the chronology work. Regarding the Taming of the Shrew, Nichol proposed that Shakespeare had read Nash in 1589, yet he observed that two of Nash's later books feature the closest parallels, even though, as he put it, they are probably too late to be specific influences on Shrew. Well, they're too late to be any influence on Shrew. He has no explanation for how this could possibly have happened. Regarding Love's Labor's Lost, Shakespeare supposedly borrowed from Strange News to create the character Don Armado, but the parallels go on too long for the orthodox dating of the play. Quote, Nash's whole account of Harvey's reveling and domineering at all the end appears in Have With You to Saffron Walden, not published until 1596. Shakespeare cannot be borrowing from it as such. Well, there's no as such here. He cannot be borrowing from it at all. And Nash, in turn, cannot be borrowing from Shakespeare because he offers more details about Harvey's reveling and domineering than Shakespeare does. If Nash is Shakespeare, the conundrum evaporates. Now, here's something pretty striking. Oxford's personal cares, to an amazing extent, show up in Nash's works. Let's look at some of the overlapping interests among Nash, Shakespeare, and Oxford. Nash and Shakespeare are equally upset over Harvey's disrespect for the Earl of Oxford, both at Audley End in 1578 and in his Latin poem Tuscanisme in 1580. Shakespeare's knowledge of the quarrel is intimate and acute and, not surprisingly in our context, entirely in sympathy with Nash. Nash has the same three enemies as Shakespeare, Gabriel Harvey, Hugh Sanford, and William Brook, Lord Cobham. Now, these are not the most prominent people in Elizabethan times, but some, for some reason, Nash and Shakespeare both grouse about these three people. They use puns when they talk about them and so forth, and they do it in a very similar manner. Nash even has the same friends as Shakespeare slash Oxford. Nash has kind words for war hero Sir Roger Williams, the model for Shakespeare's Flewellyn and Henry V. Nash met him at Arundel House on the Strand. Is that interesting? I think so, because that house was owned by the Howard family 
of Oxford's cousins. Nash, we are told, knew two of the Oxonian wits particularly well. Who were they? John Lilly and Thomas Watson. Well, John Lilly was Oxford's personal secretary. Of course, he knew him well. And Thomas Watson dedicated his only book of English poetry to the Earl of Oxford. Nash and Shakespeare even seemed to have the same girlfriend. In The Unfortunate Traveler, the hero, Jack Wilton, has a girlfriend that several different scholars have noted sounds an awful lot like Shakespeare's Dark Lady. Shakespeare, Nash, and Oxford cared about the Earl of Southampton, and they did so at the same time. Southampton is the dedicatee of Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis of 1593 and Lucrece of 1594. Southampton is also the dedicatee of Nash's The Unfortunate Traveler, which was registered in 1593 and published in 1594. In the dedication, Nash says to Southampton something absolutely fascinating, and I don't think it has much meaning in the Orthodox context, but it certainly does in ours. He tells him, A new brain, a new wit, a new style, a new soul, will I get me to canonize your name to posterity. What in the world is he saying? This is the Earl of Oxford saying to the Earl of Southampton, Look, I already... I canonized your name to posterity through this guy Shakespeare, and now I'm going to do it through a new name, Thomas Nash, who has a new wit and a new style, which he did. And, of course, tying it to Oxford until November 1594, Southampton was being encouraged to marry Oxford's daughter. Okay, let's look at Pierce Penniless from 1592. We'll find that it presents an allegory pertaining to the Earl of Oxford and a beloved cousin. Scholars have identified the players. We've got the Earl of Leicester, the Queen, Thomas Cartwright, Sir Nicholas Thotmorton, and most important, the one I've underlined here, Thomas Howard, the fourth Duke of Norfolk. And Thotmorton is included because of his dealings against Norfolk. And Leicester is included for the very same reason. When you read the entire description, you find all kinds of very obscure details but as this scholar put it, this is precisely allegorized by Nash. His allegory is perfectly in line with history. So let's ask some questions. Why would an independent Thomas Nash, who was 24 years old at the time, know or care about events of 1572 when he was only four years old? Who was Nash to, quote, have taken the risk of offending so powerful a family as the Dudleys? What motivation would he have for doing so, and how could he have gotten away with it? If Nash is Oxford, there is no mystery. Oxford was personally involved in these events, and his elevated social position allowed him to get away with writing about it. Nash, moreover, is emotional about Oxford's relatives. Nash never relates warm tales of any of his own relatives or ancestors, living or dead. Not his father, not his mother, not his sister, not his brother, not his ancestors. Yet, he expresses deep passion for members of the Earl of Oxford's extended family, in fact, twice. And let's see what scholars tell us. First, Nash's treatment of the Leicester Norfolk affair suggests his total, and I underline that word, sympathy with the betrayed Catholic nobleman. A last goodly creature is a curiously poignant epitaph for a Catholic who had been executed for treason. By the way, I'm sure many of you listening know that the term goodly creature shows up in Pericles, and goodly creatures shows up in the Tempest. Nor is this duke, we are told, Thomas Howard, the only member of the family Nash praised. The poet Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, Thomas's father, is featured prominently and approvingly in The Unfortunate Traveler. Nash praises Surrey unstintingly. If Nash is Oxford, once again, there's no mystery. Norfolk was Oxford's first cousin, for whose life he had fought in vain, and Surrey was Oxford's uncle, whose poetic inventions he adopted. These two seem to be the most important of Oxford's relatives and ancestors to him. And guess what? They're the most important people to Thomas Nash. 
Scholars have interpreted these, quote, curious praises. In other words, they don't understand where they come from, and they don't blame them because in their paradigm, they come from nowhere. They interpret them as Catholic sympathies. The same scholars tell us that Thomas Nash was raised a Puritan. They have no explanation for this. We can see they're not Catholic sympathies. They are family sympathies. Now, orthodoxy has extreme difficulty regarding Nash's one and only play, Summer's Last Will and Testament, which was composed in late 1592 for performance at Croydon, which was one of the residences of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Why would the Archbishop of Canterbury had invited a budding prose satirist, who had only two pamphlets to his name by this time, to pen a light comedy skit substantially in verse containing lute songs when he had written no play, no songs, and penned but five stanzas of poetry in his life. It makes no sense. Whitgift never would have done it. Moreover, in the weeks before the performance, quote, Nash was busy with rehearsals, props, costumes, music, and dances. Where did this youngster, then only 24 years old, get all these production skills. Once again, we have no explanation from the biographers. If Nash is Oxford, there is no mystery. Whitgift had known Oxford for 30 years, back to the days when Oxford was a student at Cambridge and Whitgift was a professor there. And of course, we all know that Oxford had written and produced many plays by this time, including numerous comedies, and many of which contained songs. And on the record, Oxford was praised for both his musical ability and dancing ability. And these are two skills that the director of this play would have needed, and Oxford had them. All right, well, there's a character in the play called Veer. He stands for spring. Well, Veer happens to use one of Shakespeare's songs and some of Oxford's own words. Clark wrote, Nash lifted the song of fear from Shakespeare's Love's Labor's Lost, making little effort to alter it. He didn't lift the song. Oxford wrote the song and simply used it in two different places. The Earl of Oxford, in a 1601 letter, wrote the following words to Robert Cecil. If it shall please Her Majesty, in regard of my youth, time, and fortune spent in her court, and fear admits to having dissipated, quote, all my flowery treasure and flower of my youth spent on good fellows using very much the same words that the Earl of Oxford did. In the sports you have seen. This is a fantastic find because Veer is telling everyone I spent a good portion of my fortune producing plays. And whoever played the Veer character, my guess is that Oxford did it, he would spread his arms wide to the audience and said, I spent all my money on this stuff. What's well, not it worth it? Isn't it fun? Summer's Last Will, moreover, is an allegory of the Cecil family at that time. I've read the play, and I can see that Summer is, is, uh, stands for William Cecil, Lord Burley. Autumn is Thomas. Winter is Robert, and Vere, of course, is Edward de Vere. So we've got Cecil, his elder son, his younger son, and his son-in-law. Alexander Waugh recently argued that Shakespeare's characters often reflect members of the Cecil family, these particular members. And here is another example, because Nash is Shakespeare, and he's doing the same thing he did in Shakespeare's plays. Now, it's very interesting, if you read... Uh, about the play in some of these biographies of Nash, you'll find people saying such things as it's a pageant of the seasons. Well, it's nothing of the kind because three of the characters, summer, autumn, and winter, are on stage virtually the entire time. What's more, the play repeatedly breaks the seasonal metaphor, and each time it breaks the seasonal metaphor, it fits the, me the allegory of the Cecil family. And we'll just look at a few of these here. For example, number one, autumn should be the heir of summer, right? But summer claims two heirs, autumn and winter. If those two seasons are heirs, so should spring be, but Veer is not included. 
In a seasonal analog, spring's wealth should flow to summer, but summer demands that Veer explain, quote, how well or ill thou hast employed my wealth. So it goes backwards. And of course, Oxford benefited from Burley's care, at least in Burley's mind, so that fits this expression. Number four, spring should yield custody to summer, but summer says, Veer's the one unto whose custody I have committed more than to the rest. Now, in our family allegory, what is he talking about? Well, he adds the words, and what thou hast of me, thou hast and holdst. Now, that's a, a legal phrase, meaning to, to fully possess something, but it's also the language of the marriage vow, to have and to hold. And what we're, what's going on here is Burley is saying to the Veer character, hey, I gave you more than the rest, I gave you my daughter. Number five, Summer places a curse on fear. Lent shall wait on thee. He's said to sing the luscious season of the year to austerity. That makes no sense, but we're going to find out in a moment that it does make sense. Because the play echoes provisions in Lord Burley's will. Summer says of autumn and winter, these two will share betwixt them what I have. And sure enough, both sons receive liberal benefits in Burley's will. Winter protests Autumn's legacy of a crown. He grouses and grumbles, and he details Autumn's shortcomings as a ruler, which fits the personalities of Thomas and Robert Cecil. Summer gets in the middle of this argument. He mediates it, saying he will yield his throne to Autumn, but make Winter his executor. If you read Lord Burley's will, which is available on the web, you will find that three times he names Robert executor over specific stipulations in the will. He doesn't name Thomas executor even once. Autumn in the play is portrayed as bookish and winter as a champion of the state. Does that sound familiar? Well, Burley's will doles out his paper treasures to his two sons accordingly. Quote, I give all my books in my upper library to my son Sir Thomas. I give unto my said son, Sir Robert, all my writings concerning the Queen's causes. In line with Summer's curse, finally, Burley's will leaves nothing at all to his son-in-law. And that was it fitting Summer's curse uh, on fear to austerity. The writer, astonishing many Orthodox scholars, escapes punishment. Would Whitgift have invited the Thomas Nash of Orthodox biography, a young impoverished pamphlet writer, to make a spectacle of the Cecil family? He would never have done it. And Bate wrote, It is absurd to suppose that any Elizabethan play might contain satiric references to any aristocrats of the day. The author of the portrait would have found himself in prison before he could turn around. Leon could not fathom how Nash got away with putting on the play, much less publishing it, quote, without a flicker of response, and no record or even report of Nash being formally punished. If Nash is Oxford, there is no mystery. He was perfectly free to caricature members of his own family, and most especially himself. He makes a spectacle of Veer that's very funny. There's no mystery, and that's why Nash, quote-unquote, Nash got away with it. All right. We have shown that Nash and Oxford are intimately entwined to the point that I think it's inescapable that we have seen that Nash is a persona of the Earl of Oxford. But we're not the only people who know this. Writers of the day revealed that they knew Nash was Oxford. Now, as a prelude to this discussion, our own Anderson wrote, quote, Sometimes when Harvey writes appears penniless, he means Nash. Yet Pierce was at other times a sobriquet for De Vere. In other words, Pierce is, quote, a conflation of Nash and Oxford. And that is exactly right. But Harvey's not mistaken or lazy in doing this. He's doing it because he knows Nash and Oxford are the same. But his knowledge is even broader than that. Harvey, in a new letter of notable contents, wrote the following sentence, and you'll see that he's going to connect Thomas Nash to three other voices of the Earl of Oxford. He writes, They may wonder how Machiavel, here he's referring to Nash, 
can teach a prince to be and not to be. This is Harvey saying, Yeah, I know you wrote Hamlet, you're Shakespeare. Religious, who within a few months is won or charmed or enchanted, or what metamorphosis should I term it? And here he's saying, Yeah, I know you wrote Arthur Golding's Metamorphoses as well. And whom shall he cunny catch or crossbite? And there he is using the topic of Robert Greene's final five pamphlets where he wrote about conny catchers or con men and con women. So he's basically leaving breadcrumbs all over the place so that Nash or Oxford knows that he knows who he is. He's Shakespeare, he's Arthur Golding, he's Robert Greene, he's Thomas Nash, and Harvey knows it and he says so. Now people reading this don't really understand where Harvey's coming from, but it's pretty clear once you get the context right. In Pierce's supererogation in 1593, and I think this is uh, virtually a smoking gun, Harvey threatens to tell the world that Nash is Oxford. He writes, I could hear disbask such a rich mummer and make this pamphlet the most saleable book in London and myself one of the famousest authors in England. Now, a lover is one who goes merrymaking in disguise. That's exactly what Oxford was doing with his voices. He was going merrymaking in disguise. And Harvey was basically said, you know, if I wanted to, I could tell the world who you really are. But his next sentence, he said, but I won't do it. And, of course, we know why he didn't do it. He had to hide out for weeks in the house of a nobleman after Oxford got annoyed when he published Tuscanismi. And he doesn't want to repeat that. And he probably knows that Oxford's being paid by the administration to do what he's doing. So this goes further than just Oxford. It goes all the way up to the Queen, and there was no way he was going to risk his life and reveal who Oxford was. Harvey's not the only one who knew about it. Richard Litchfield, in his pamphlet, has his own version of Ben Jonson's Read If Thou Canst. Here's what he writes in the trimming of Thomas Nash. Quote, now I give not every word their literal sense to see if by illusions you can pick out the true meaning. So he's, he's telling him, there's, there is a hidden message in here, see if you can find it. Now here's the context of that statement. A little bit more text. He says, I say you say true, then what I say of you is true. For babes and fools say true. Now I give not every word their literal sense to see if by illusions you can pick out the true meaning. For if you will understand anything aright, you must, Evere, apply it to yourself. He is talking to Thomas Nash, but he's really addressing the Earl of Oxford. Now we're going to jump to a slightly different to topic. We've been showing that Nash is Oxford that people knew that Nash was Oxford. But there's so much more to the orthodox biography of Thomas Nash. It's not just that he leaves so many clues that he is the Earl of Oxford, and I've left out many of them, because we're not going to take all day to do this. There are also many internal contradictions to Nash's biography, which are instantly resolved when you realize that he's truly the Earl of Oxford. Let's go down a short list. This is not all the items, but it's a few, and they're very telling. Nash had a very meager output. In his entire life, he wrote one story, seven pamphlets, and only one and a half plays. Why? Because Oxford was busy. He was actually busy writing under other people's names as well, along with his own life that he had to lead. Nash has knowledge of obscure sailing lingo. Nash never went to sea. The most water he ever crossed was on the way over to the Isle of Wight, which was about a 10-minute ferry ride. Oxford, however, did sail, and he crossed the channels at least six times. Nash has knowledge of the Master of Arts ceremonies at both Cambridge and Oxford. Nash only went to Cambridge. Oxford participated in both of these ceremonies. Now, you could say, oh, maybe uh, Nash could have known about that. Maybe a buddy told him. Well, that's true, but he but Nash does not talk about his life at Cambridge. The only thing he talks about here is the ceremonies, the graduation ceremonies, and we know that Oxford participated in both of those. So it's a very selective uh, bit of information and perfectly fits the Earl of Oxford. He has knowledge of the finest homes and estates in Italy. 
Well, Nash never went to Italy. His biography doesn't even allow him time to have gone to Italy. But Oxford lived in Italy, and because he was an earl, he would have access to the finest homes and estates. Nash somehow, at around age 19, began to show that he had knowledge of Italian, French, Greek, Latin, and Spanish. There's no indication of where he learned all those languages so well, but Oxfordians already have discovered that these are languages in which Oxford was fluent and which Shakespeare knew just as well. Nash, quote, invented neologisms on a large scale. You can't just breeze past this fact. This is an extremely rare talent. Among all the writers in the history of English, very few have enriched the language on a large scale. The only one I know of besides Nash is Shakespeare. And I think it's because they're the same person. And finally, and this is virtually a trump card when you tell people that Shakespeare knew the law backwards and forwards. Well, it turns out that Thomas Nash knew the law too. The whole of strange news is conceived of in terms that recall those used in a court of law. And of course, Oxford went to Gray's Inn and he knew the law. Nash did not go to law school and he didn't have time to go to law school. He graduated supposedly in 1588 and he was writing pamphlets in 1589. Orthodoxy skates past these anomalies and many others, just as it does with Shakespeare. It just pretends they're not there. You know, la di da di da it's a haunted house, but I don't, I've got my eyes closed. And as Oxfordians, we don't want to do the same thing. We have to look at these facts and account for them. And if our paradigm can't account for them, as it does, then it's got to be the correct paradigm.